Hello and welcome back to Microbiome Live. We are broadcasting to you today from Southern Oregon at the headquarters of Microbiome Software. And we're glad that you took the time to join in on our conversation this morning. This week, we are gonna be talking about CNC tooling. So a lot of you may already have your tooling requirements sorted out, but today we're gonna to be covering some information that may help you refine the way that you use your CNC tooling. We're also gonna be reviewing some of the questions submitted by our users and we'll open the hood uh, to demonstrate some of those answers to you live. So we invited a, a couple people today to help us out with the presentation and the topic today. First up, we have Karen Deutschler and Josh Lane from GDP Industrial Tooling. Thank you both for joining in on our conversation. Thank you for having us. We also invited Matt Honies from our product quality team and he's gonna be covering some of the information and topics related to the tool setup within the Microbiome software. Thanks for having me, Clay. Before we get started, let's review how the episode is going to work today. We're going to be covering a lot of information. Um, your mics have been muted, but we do want to hear from you. So be sure to use the question and answer UI uh, that's down there in the, in the panel uh, that you see most likely at the bottom of your screen. Uh, you just click the Q&A panel and that will open up the uh, dialogue there. Um, we have a number of techs helping out behind the scenes, so be sure to keep those questions flowing. Uh, we are here to help. And we also have a chat feature that you most likely found by now. Um, we use that for running commentary throughout the event, uh, the episode today. But we do encourage you, if you have a question, um, to ask it there via that official Q&A panel. All right, well, let's get right into it then. Let's uh, talk to Karen and Josh a bit. Thank you again for being here. Um, for those that are unfamiliar with uh, GDP, why don't we take just a few minutes to get to know you both and uh, what you do? Well, thank you very much. Um, and again, thank you for having us. We uh, really appreciate the opportunity to talk about our cutting tool program. Uh, most of you might be familiar under the, uh, with our company under the name Gudo. We have been in the US market for 30 years under the Gudo banner. And we are currently undergoing a rebranding um, to better represent our tooling group. Um, of course, we continue to have the Gudo circular saw blades and Gudo knives uh, in our program, um, but the um, CNC tooling specifically will all be under the CNC under the uh, GDP tooling brand in the future. So um, with that, uh, I'd like to um, share that we've put together a CNC tooling guide, which uh, includes most of the questions that we get day in, day out. Um, and even um, the well-seasoned woodworker sometimes isn't quite certain um, how, what tool to use or what feed rates to run. And uh, so we hope that this uh, tooling guide will be of help to everyone. It's available online and we're going to cover a little bit of um, its content here in the next few slides. So um, with that, let's uh, move on to the next slide, I guess. All right, so solid carbide bits. Um, that's the workhorse of the CNC machine, really. Most everybody is using um, solid carbide um, router bits of one kind or another. We need to go back one slide. Um, uh, we have, of course, uh, compression bits, upcuts, downcuts, O flutes, um, and uh, chip breakers for plywood. And um, one thing that is important to know when you're ordering a solid carbide bit is um, to make sure you're getting the right carbide grade for the material that's being machined, because that will make a big difference in tool life. Um, as we see, a lot of people don't realize that there are different carbide grades and the difference is mainly in the binder that will affect tool life and it can make the difference between 10 panels or 100 panels. So um, when, when purchasing, always make sure that um, the supplier knows what's being machined. All right. So in the next slides here, we're just gonna show some examples of uh, alternative options to machine different materials. Not everything has to be done with a solid carbide bit, nor is it always the most economical tool to um, machine different materials. So um, Josh, will go over these 
Uh, next few slides. So here you can see that we have uh, multiplex and veneer composite panels. And in this list here, you can see the tools that are most commonly used to machine it. And in the image, you can see how the tool is actually doing the cutting process. And over the next few, we're just going to go over the types of materials just so you can get a gist of general idea mm -hmm. of what tools are commonly used for these materials. So, like I said, this is multiplex and veneer composite panel. This is uh, phenolic and cement fiberboard. And you can see the common applications that are used with the list of tools here. And then we have plywood with paper laminate. And again, the common tools. And then solid wood. In particular, this would be an oak. And the following tools that is typically used here as well. And lightweight veneered honeycomb panels. And the respective tooling. And of course, one thing that always should be considered is, um, you know, how much of a specific um, material are you going to be cutting, whether or not you're going to stick with, for instance, a solid carbide bit or look for a more um, appropriate tool to maximize tool life and, and keep the cost, machining cost down. But this is just to show some examples of, of different options available. Here we have carbon fiber and wood veneer and particle board. And lastly, we have polyurethane foam with an aluminum laminate. And that's just to kind of show you guys um, just how many different materials require different types of tooling and that there is a variety of tooling that can be put into a CNC and not just your typical solid carbide bit. And moving forward, we'll get into the, the answers to some of the questions that we more commonly receive um, and hope to pinpoint the, uh, the questions that most people have and hopefully pinpoint the questions that you all have. So get into it. The first topic is um, a dust nut. Is it effective on your machine? This, um, it, it really can, cannot contribute to the dust nut in itself. It is an all around, um, the effect of it is an all around performance based on a lot of different things. For instance, it is extremely more effective when it is less than a quarter of an inch from the surface that you're cutting than if it's a half of an inch. That, in, or that distance right there can greatly impact how effective the dust nut is. In addition, if your dust extraction system is not performing very well, well, all it's going to do is lift the dust and put it back on the table. So the best way for a dust nut to work is um, as a complement to your existing dust extraction system. Awesome. Hey, so, hey Josh. Yep. Just one of the questions related to, to that. This is a, a common thing that our customers have to deal with. So whether that sawdust buildup, like you said, is left over on the table um, and they're cutting a different route or it's, you know, sprayed across and ends up in a groove somewhere, that is a common problem that uh, have, we have to deal with or our customers are dealing with. And so this mm -hmm. dust nut, how common would you say or well known would you say this type of um, add on to the collet there or the dust nut there is? Well there are um, numerous tooling companies that are offering um, one version or another of this um, uh, dust extraction nut. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, you know, it, it doesn't, as Josh said, it doesn't always perform the same. It mm -hmm. varies by, you know, application. So um, for that reason alone, we have uh, implemented a, a demo um, program where somebody, if they think, you know, if they, if they want to be able to reduce the dust and, and are not sure they want to spend the money for the dust nut, they can get a demo from us and we have a, a small processing fee, I think it's $50 or something, um, and, they, and we send one out so they can test it. If they like it, they send it back and they get a new one. Mm -hmm. 
Is this something so, that you see um, wear, wear and tear on very often, or how often would I need to be purchasing something like this? Well, um, that can um, wear out. Obviously, it's not designed to um, last as long as a tool holder will. Um, but, um, you know, it, it probably, again, it depends on how many machine hours, you know, you're mm -hmm. running. Um, but I would say in your average shop, you might have to replace it after a year or so. I see. I mean, ours just has a ceramic coating on it. Mm -hmm. um, so that does um, improve um, the, the tool life. Well, good. Um, we do have some other questions that are coming in. There's a number of ones that we've prepared for that uh, come in prior to the, um, you know, during registration time for today's episode. Mm -hmm. But there are some questions that are rolling in now that maybe we should take a, just a minute to address here. We've got one from Scott Purdom. It's a pretty basic question. Um, he wants to know if you guys are available in the UK. Is GDP available over there or is, or is it more of the Gudo line? Uh, no, we are, okay, no, we don't have, in the UK, we do not have anyone um, uh, representing our company. So mm -hmm. if anybody in the UK um, would be interested, they would have to contact us direct. We do export, um, mm -hmm. you know, throughout the world. Um, not, not a huge amount of export, but we do export and, um, uh, so if somebody is interested, they could certainly email us and, and um, we'd be happy to help. Right. Good. All right. So there's another one here. I think we're going to get to it in a bit here. Uh, it's related to some other things that we're going to be talking about. But uh, Luke wants to know, what do you recommend for cutting 11 16th inch industrial grade particle board with high pressure plastic laminate on two sides? Um, I think we might be covering a little bit of that information, but uh, uh -huh. is there a specific bit that jumps out in your mind in terms of what well, you Well, it, it always depends because, you know, our big concern is that we want to provide our customers with the, uh, the tool that is, first of all, going to give them the finish that they're expecting as well as, um, you know, the cost relative to the job at hand. And um, so if this is an application where uh, he is machining a lot of this material, then I would definitely say a diamond bit would be the solution. If it's the same thickness, if it's, you know, a, a ton of panels that need to be machined, diamond is going to be your best bet. It's going to be your lowest cost. And, um, you know, it's going to um, provide the finish that, that you're looking for. Right. And so his uh, kind of follow-up question related to that, which maybe he already has the answer based off of how you just responded, um, but he wants to know about sharpening that bit, and that's not something you would typically do with a diamond, perhaps. Yeah, we do. Well, um, for instance, we have um, a variety of diamond tools that we actually stock um, that um, some can be sharpened, some can't. For instance, mm -hmm. um, half-inch bits, we have um, a disposable half-inch bit, and uh, it could be sharpened once. It doesn't have to be. Sometimes people don't bother to send it back because when you sharpen it, you're, you're losing a little bit of the clearance, so the tool life will be reduced a little bit after sharpening. Mm -hmm. um, so we've got the half inch non-resharpenable. We have a half inch um, that can be sharpened um, about three times. Um, then we have um, a half inch with two solid opposite shear tips on it. So it doesn't have your typical segmented PCD. It has a, a solid PCD tip on each wing and uh, they're positioned on opposite shear so that you get an excellent finish top and bottom when you're routing. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then we also have a three flute half inch bit uh, that it has a segmented uh, design as well as a three flute, although we don't stock that one here, we bring that in from Germany as needed. We have a three flute also solid PCD design, um, solid PCD tips. Mm -hmm. So there's a, there's a variety, and what we do is we look at what you know what the specific application is, and you know how much has to be machined. If it's an on, ongoing production, then um, obviously we're, we're going to look for you know the solution that will will deliver what the customer is looking for at the best price. Mm -hmm. Good. Uh, he has one follow-up qu uh, question uh, related to that. Um, you know, he could be using diamond, and like you said, that could be a version that maybe is sharpened once, maybe it's sharpened uh, 
not at all. But how many panels do you think that he could get out of that before the quality starts to diminish or degrade? Okay, so that's that's a good question because it's, we get that all the time. How many panels can I get out of this tool or that tool? It doesn't matter whether it's carbide or diamond. We get the same question. Um, anybody that ever gives you a number is, you know, is really guessing because um, the the tool life really depends on um, much more. It depends on first of all the clamping system, you know, if, if you've got an old collet in, in the tool holder, um, then you're going to get um, a lot of chattering during the cut and that's gonna reduce the tool life. And, um, uh, you know, so there, there's many different things that uh, affect it. The material that you're machining, the content of the laminate, for instance, how much aluminum oxide is in the laminate, you know, the, 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 there, there's many, many, um, oh, and, and of course, whether you're running at the right feed rate or not, um, right chip load. So um, my uh, answer to that question is always, if you're going to con consider a diamond tool based on what you're getting with a carbide tool right now, because that would be running under the same circumstances most likely that the diamond tool would be. Um, if, you're, if you're getting, let's say, 30 panels with a carbide bit right now, then multiply that by 15 and you wouldn't be disappointed. Okay, so if you base, if you can justify the cost of a diamond bit based on achieving 15 times longer tool life than the carbide bit, then you're going to be okay. Great, yeah, so hopefully Luke, that answers your question if you have uh... Some other follow-up questions on that, uh, feel free to uh, let us know there and we'll get back to you uh, as far as those goes. Uh, Scott, I see your recent question that popped in uh, related to the feed rates. We're going to be covering that. There's actually been a number of questions related to this topic, so kind of proves the point that that is a very common thing that people are facing and wanting to know the different uh, optimum loads and the feed speeds. We are going to be covering that in just a bit, so uh, we will pause on that one or hold on that answer to that question. Um, let's get into one of another question that comes up a bit, uh, and it has to do with collets. We received this a few times actually in our um, polling that we sent out, and they want to know how long they should last and what are some of the signs they should look for in terms of wear and tear. Okay, so collets are, you know, such a, well, they're, they're an important part of the, the whole tooling setup, obviously, um, and um, they should be replaced every 500 machine hours. Um, I know a lot of people don't. I've, I've spoken to customers that have had the same collets running for five, six, seven years and have never replaced them. Um, this is really being penny wise and pound foolish because um, collets cost about, uh, depending on style, 26 to $30. And um, so there's, uh, there's really no reason why they shouldn't be uh, replaced in a timely fashion because what what happens when you don't replace them is that you do get some chattering um, you can break um, bits with bad collet you can have bits slipping out of the collet um, and uh, you know to, to replace them at 500 machine hours for $30 is, is really a no-brainer and um, I think having that as part of a, a maintenance schedule um, is a wise thing to do Mm -hmm. Definitely sounds like it can uh, help you avoid those costly repairs mm. of slideshows. Yeah, yeah. But you can also, I mean, I don't know how to explain it, but when you've got a bad collet, I mean, when you put it on the table, it clings like, it makes a sort of a, 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 a strange sound. It doesn't sound like the new, you know, when you put a new collet down, it sounds mm -hmm. solid. Mm -hmm. When you have an old collet, it sort of clings like an, almost like an echo. Mm. Yeah, so that's a good uh, tip there for those of you who want to start evaluating your college to see if they might need to be replaced. Sounds like and, a, and the other important thing is, of course, when you're replacing tools and collets, you know, always get all the dust out of the tool holder and clean the collets before you put a new tool in. Mm -hmm. Good. All right. So if you guys have questions on that further, feel free to let us know while we're on this subject. Um, yeah, so hopefully, Scott, there, that answers your question there, addresses that, that concern. Definitely, collets are something you want to look out for. Uh, that question that came in there, that comment there. Uh, so hopefully that helps, Scott. 
So our next question that came in uh, from a user in uh, Alabama was related to, um, let's look here, go back here. Yeah, it was related to knowing the best tool to use for MDF uh, in particle board. So whether it was carbide or diamond tooling. And so we did prepare for an answer for that. And so, uh, yeah, so that's the question. All right, so again, it, it's gonna boil down to um, how much you're machining. If you're machining the same material, MDF or particle board, day in, day out, and the same thickness, then diamond tooling is really the most cost-effective way to do that. Um, what we usually do, or what we like to do when we when we sell diamond tools, is um, put them on a uh, put the diamond tool on an HSK heat shrink tool holder. What that eliminates is the risk that we're sending a good banking brand new diamond tool to a customer who's going to mount that onto a three-year-old collet mm -hmm. and a, a tool holder that has a static collet nut. Um, that's a recipe for failure. So when we, when we do sell diamond tools, we do like to know, you know what the setup is going to be to make sure that they are going to perform as they are intended to. Mm -hmm. So um, again, if somebody's machining MDF or particle board three quarter inch, same laminate, you know, all the time, um, I would say diamond is going to save them a lot of money. Well, good. Okay, that, I think that covers that question thoroughly. Um, well, let's move on. So we talked about diamond, you know, when to use it. We're talking about MDF particle board and the recommendation there is for the diamond, but when, when would we not want to use it? And so that's the focus of our next question that is uh, related to when, when should we consider not using diamond tooling? Okay. So for instance, if, um, if you've got a, um, you know, a small cabinet shop and you're making plywood cabinets today and tomorrow it's going to be MDF, um, and, and the day after you're going to be machining some particle board um, uh, panels. And um, you really want to do that with, you want a, a tool that's going to machine all of them, then um, you definitely don't want a diamond tool because it, it likes to cut, diamond tools perform best when they're cutting the same material all the time. Mm -hmm. and, um, and not switch back and forth. Um, and even even with carbide tooling in a case like that, um, if you would if you were doing this properly, you would have a chip breaker compression bit for the plywood, and you would have um, you know a a compression bit for let's say the MDF, and then if you were machining melamine, melamine, you would have yet another compression bit with a different carbide grade for that. So, I mean, it, that even applies to carbide, but because when you're spending more money with a diamond tool, obviously you don't want to find out that it's not going to be able to, you know, to, to, to be run on all those materials, um, you know, sort of like a jack of all trades. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a good takeaway from what I just heard you just say about the diamond tooling in terms of, you know, keeping it, if you've got a certain material, that's the tool that the diamond bit, you know, is kind of associated with. And we're going to actually cover a bit of that um, mm -hmm. in our later part it here has. with Matt. But, you know, it has sure. to do, it has to do really with the way the, um, the wear um, pattern occurs on the, on the edge of the diamond um, tool, you know, the cutting edge, mm -hmm. um, you know, it leaves little um, wear patterns in the material. So if you were cutting, for instance, particle board, um, you would you would have these little um, you know they, if you looked under a microscope you would see these tiny little breakouts from the um, from the particle board but then if you go back to cut um, let's say uh, MDF you wouldn't get as good a finish you wouldn't notice it on the particle board but you wouldn't get as good a finish anymore on the MDF so mm -hmm. you know when you switch back and forth like that it's just not a good thing right. Well, good. Yeah. And as I was saying, the, uh, we are going to be covering a bit about that, um, how to define those, mat those tools per material. So if this is something that you want to do, a tip that you picked up from here today, I think uh, you might like to understand how we do that. So we'll cover that in a little bit. So I think that covers that question fairly well. Um, so the next one is, uh, let's see here, related to looks like the chip load. Um, so, you know, from time to time we get asked about the feed rates and the chip load and, 
you know, mm -hmm. the, in our system, we can define the feed speeds and spindle speeds and all that stuff. You can also do that your CNC machine, but they want to figure out the questions related to what, how do I know what is the optimum speed? And so that's mm -hmm. the focus of the next question that we have that comes in. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the wrong slide there. It is the wrong slide. Go back to that. Um, okay, so the chip load obviously is, is different um, based on what material is being cut. And um, this is a little um, small print here, but um, so as you can see, you've got, um, based on the tool diameter, you, you would have a different chip load, half, half an inch diameter and up, it, it, you use the same value. But um, these charts are based on um, chip load, diameter of the tool, um, and um, cutting depth being equal to the diameter, all right? So if you're the deeper cuts, you're gonna make adjustments to that as as shown in this um, table. And then it's also based on doing a peripheral cut. So when you're doing a parting cut that you're cutting through the material with material on both sides of the, the tool, then you're going to reduce that further. Mm -hmm. Now there is a, um, on the next slide, uh, for those of you that are machining, um, you know, the same material all the time, and that we see that actually a lot. I would say you should follow this, these instructions here to find your optimum chip load, okay? Um, and uh, this is also explained in our uh, CNC tooling guide. So um, uh, this, is, this is really the way to make sure that you are um, indeed uh, running, running the, the best chip load for, for your material. And of course, when, when you take the time to do this, you're going to um, you know, optimize the tool life and you'll be reducing your cost. And so I, I definitely recommend this. Um, the other thing you want to look for is um, heat buildup on the tool. If you're seeing that, you've got the wrong chip load. Go back to the drawing board and, and calculate or start the calculation over. Mm -hmm. And um, it's it's definitely worth the time because you'll you'll be spending less on on cutting tools. Mm -hmm. Well, good. And as you mentioned there again, the uh, CNC tooling guide that is, there is a link there I posted for everyone to get, and you can go to that website and download that uh, CNC tooling guide mm -hmm. from that URL. And it's also available in hard copy. If anybody wants one, they can just simply shoot an email to us and ask for a copy with the ad with their address, and we'll be happy to send it out. Mm -hmm. All right, great. So let me check the questions that are coming in. I think we are up to date with those that are in the system so far. Let's uh, switch things up a little bit. Um, let's cover another question. This came in from uh, one of our users in Australia, Eddie John. Um, he had a few questions and one of his is fairly basic and that'll be kind of the segue into some of the other ones that we'll cover. But Matt is going to be helping us out with the answers to these questions. And his first question is a fairly basic one, but something that every user should understand. And it has to do with setting up tooling in Microvellum in the tool file interface. And so Matt, are you available there to help us out with show, uh, an instruction on how to add those tools? I am. Great. So go ahead and uh, take control of the screen. Okay. So what we're going to cover today um, is just a quick explanation of how to add um, just a basic router to your tool file. Um, so the first step you want to do is you want to obviously open up Toolbox. Um, and then you're going to go into your Toolbox setup and then to your options page. Um, we do this because it's the easiest way to locate your tool file under the machining tab because we're gonna be using both the spreadsheet and the interface. Um, so if you're making a change to your primary tool file and you want to um, add a router, um, the easiest way to go about doing this is to first open up your spreadsheet. And if you come to the tooling tab, what you'll do is you'll find in here that it's set up almost exactly like the interface is. So you'll have your vertical routers, your horizontal and or your 
vertical drills, your horizontal drills, and then your routers. So if we're gonna add a router, um, the easiest way to do this is to find a router that's similar to the one that you're gonna add. Um, and then we're going to just right click next to it and insert a row. And then we're going to copy the row of the tool that you're, chain you're wanting to copy pretty much. And then we're going to change this to change me. And then we're going to exit out, save, and then we're going to come into the interface. So in the interface, we're going to go to the tools tab, and then we're going to select the routers. And you'll see in here, we should have one that is now named change me. Oh, here it is right here. So we do this because it lets you know everything that you need to set uh, because everything is already filled out. Um, so it just makes it a little bit easier on you. Um, so first off, what you want to do is add the name of your tool. Um, most commonly, this is used to describe what your tool is. Um, so what we're going to call this one, I'm just going to call this Tool 3, and I'm going to call it a half inch. And then underneath, you'll see that there is a common tool name and an actual tool name. So how to differ differentiate the two? The common tool name is how Microvellum finds the tool for when you're using it to uh, machine when you're drawing your cabinets. Um, so this one needs to be different than all of the other tools. So I'm going to go ahead and just call this tool one. The actual tool name is what your machine uses to call that tool out. Um, so what I normally recommend is opening up your tool list in your machine and finding what that tool is called. Sometimes it's a description of the tool, so it could just be called um, half inch router. Um, it could be kind of like we have in here, 102. Um, it depends on how your machine names your tools. Um, so normally I recommend opening up your tool list in your machine and finding what those tool names are. Uh, next step. Hey Matt, yep. before you move on, uh, there's a, um, a point to bring out about the, what you're covering right now uh, related to the common and actual tool names. So I think one of the things to drive home with that piece right there, because it's a fairly uh, really nice feature, especially with companies that have multiple CNC machines, you may have you know five different machines out in your shop and the tool, tooling you may have you know in the same positions, you might have a half inch in, in position one and a half inch in position two on another machine. And it kind of the way to unify the, the tooling. Um, and we can change the bits that are actually needing to be included within the G-code itself, as opposed to what is going to be called within the system. So it's a way of, of differentiating that, especially if you consider the fact that not all those machines may be the same. So for example, on an SCM machine, it might be a tool 101, but on a, on a Como or something different, it might be a T1 or a tool one. And so there's different ways of, of referring to that. And so this right here allows that flexibility to be able to control uh, all the machines uh, simultaneously by one master file. Yeah, that's a great point. Especially, yeah, especially if you're going to be building, say you want to cut multiple products, but they're the same product. You, in your processing station, you can select both of those processing stations. So like your SCM, and your BSE machine, if the common tool names match, you can select both of those machines and machine the same products on two different machines. So it saves your guys' time. Yep, good point. Thanks for bringing that up, Clay. <laughs> um, so next up is the tool diameter. Um, this, um, you wanna make sure you have an accurate diameter in there. Um, because this is going to affect how um, the routing is set up um, when you're creating your product. Um, so you want to make sure that this is an accurate diameter um, for the bit that is on your machine. Um, 
Next are the feed entry and rotation speeds. Um, these, we recommend getting the information from either your machine manufacturer or your tooling manufacturer. So if you were to get GDP Gudo tools, I would recommend using their calculator to figure out what your feed and entry and rotation speeds are um, because that's going to be the best way to reduce the wear and tear on your machine and on your bits. Um, next up is the height offset and diameter offset. Both of these are located on your machine also. Um, so you want to get those from your machine based on your tool. Um, and then these are kind of the other settings on here are kind of self-explanatory. Um, these are setting up your defaults. Um, so depending on what tools you want to use for like your default router and your normal or your mirror field, your border tool, your pocketing tool, and then you can actually set up default tools for sort certain things in your products. So like your back dado for your base cabinets, those can be set here along in, along as in your global settings. And that's all I needed to cover on um, the adding a tool. Um, vertical drills and horizontal drills um, are a lot more in depth on setting up new vertical drills and horizontal drills. Um, I recommend contacting um, our tech support um, and they can put you in contact with one of our um, CNC techs to help you better know um, how to change your vertical drills and horizontal drills because there's a lot more that goes into that like where your drills are actually located on your machine because you can't just throw them in any any spot. Right. So there's one thing to be said about actually changing the diagram or the makeup of how the uh, the vertical controller head there looks, but there's another to related to you know swapping out diameters and things like that. And so this is an interface as well that you can change that information as you can see there on the screen. We have different variables that can be modified fairly quickly and easily. Yes. So did you have right. uh, another yep. question you want to yep. answer? There were a couple more, and uh, this is another one from Eddie John as well as Linda there in at Precision Millwork. She wanted to know about multi-pass tools and how to set that up. Okay, multi-pass tools are a fun one. So we have three different types of multi-tools or um, as we call them here, 900 tools. Um, so if we go in back into the interface and we go to the routers, I'll go down to our 900 tools. So you'll see here I already have two set up in my tool file. So I have a multiple tool and a multiple passes tool. Um, so the easiest way to set up a new multi-tool um, is when you come into your um, router section on your tool file, you can click the add new multi-pass tool button right here. Um, and this will automatically add a new 900 tool. So if you don't have any, it will start out at 900 and then move up from there. So it'll be 901, 902. Um, but with the multi-pass tools, we have different types. So we have the multiple tool, which allows you to use multiple different tool numbers, default tools on here. So you'll see I'm using my 101, 102, 102, and 101 again. Um, and they're both, they're all three set up at different depths. So it's going to use the three different tools in different pass, in multiple passes um, to get to your desired depth. Um, so it's not going to use the same tool um, unless you have it set up that way for each pass. Um, on the multiple tools one, you do, on here you, you leave the common tool name exactly what it is set up as. Um, you don't have to put an actual tool name because it's gonna use the tool names from your tool list down here. Um, and then the second one is the multiple passes tool. So this one uses one tool number. Um, so this one, you would leave the common tool number what it is, but your actual tool name would be 
the number of the tool that you want to use from your routers you already have set up. Um, and you would set up the diameter, feed speeds, entry speeds, exactly the same as you have that router already set up. And then down here in the multipass tool information, we actually have a number of passes. So what this is gonna do is it's going to take the depth of the route you're cutting and split that if you have it in, have your number of passes set as two, it's going to take that depth and split it in half. So each pass is going to cut half of that route. So it's not going to just go to depth and cut through. It's gonna to go to half. So let's say you have a um, inch depth route. So it's going to cut half an inch the first pass and half an inch the second pass. And that's how it's gonna cut that route. Um, but we also do have an incremental step. So this is um, another kind of like the step one. Um, or multi-pass, it's going to do the same thing, but instead of selecting the number of passes that you want, this one is going to figure it out based on the max depth per pass that you want. Um, so if you only want it to cut like half an inch per pass and you have an inch route, it's going to make four passes to cut to depth, um, if that, does that make sense, Clay? Yep, that makes sense. Okay, perfect. Um, so this one, the multi-pass um, incremental step is going to be set up exactly like the multi-pass one. You would want to leave the common tool name the same, but you're going to um, add your tool down, or, oops, you're going to have your actual tool name and tool diameter and everything set up um, exactly like the router that you're going to be using for that multi-pass um, tool. And so you want to set this up exactly the same. Um, usually what I recommend if you're going to set up a multi-pass tool um, and you know what tool you want to use, take a screenshot of the settings you have for that tool that way you don't have to keep hitting the apply button and switching back so that you can verify that everything is correct. You can have it on a second screen or have it so you can pull it up and input that information in there. Um, but we do have a very helpful document on our support site. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and link that to everybody in the um, chat section. That way you can have that. Um, it's a very helpful document that um, we use to set up the multi-pass tools. All right, great. Uh, there's a couple, were you done with this part? Yes. So there was a, a question here from Justin. Did we, did we touch on the prioritization there in that last uh, UI? Um, the priority settings for, for the multi-pass? Uh, we did not. So the, the wording of them, they're pretty self-explanatory. We have, uh, and maybe you want to cover this, but we have different ways of grouping things together. So we're going to be able to prioritize based off of, uh, you know, reducing the number of tool changes or even grouping uh, tools together. Um, yep. Yeah, and there's nice, helpful um, little tool tips that come up. Um, so like the reduced tool changes, um, allows tools and multi-pass tool to be prioritized with other routing operations. Um, the group multi-pass tools uh, will not allow tools with, whoops, within a multi-pass tool to be prioritized with other routing operations. And then this one segregates. So tools will be forced to complete a single routing operation, um, including all necessary tool changes within it before continuing on to the next routing operation. So these are nice little helpful tool tips we have on here to kind of explain um, what those do. Um, but mo most people I see that use this use the reduced tool changes because it's, it's definitely helpful. 
Yeah, good. Hopefully there that Justin that answers your questions related to that. If you had something more specific, feel free to shoot us a, a, a follow up there on your question. Um, I'll go ahead and mark that as done for that one. Let's see, there is another thing in here. Let me go back to my questions that we collected. Um, it was related to Oh, there it is. Yeah. So I mentioned this earlier uh, when we were talking with Karen about uh, her the example she gave about diamond tooling and how you would want to have a specific tool if you are using diamond tooling associated to a certain material type. So it's always cutting the same. And so a way that we can handle that is by going into the material and having the ability to control the tool type per material. And so this was the focus of other questions that we had related to this piece. Okay, so you're talking the material code overrides, correct? That's the one. Perfect. Okay, so with the material code overrides, um, most people do this in the library level, um, but you can do it in the project level also. It's just a little more difficult because you have to make a project level material and then go in and edit it. Um, I normally recommend doing it at the library level if you're going to do it. Um, so what you'll do is you'll open up your spec group setup. You'll select the um, material that you're wanting to add the um, code override to, and then you'll go ahead and select the open material file. And when we come in here, you can then find the material that you're wanting to put the override on. Um, you'll see here, I already have one that has it, so we'll go to one that I don't. We'll go ahead and right click and edit select and material. And once you go into the edit material screen, you'll see here that there is a field called code. So this is where we would put the material code overrides. So there is a specific syntax we use when doing these tool overrides, um, and it is T for tool number. And then, so I would do T101 um, because that's one of my tools. And then you would do space. And if you wanted to set a specific feed speed for this material, you could um, by putting F and then whatever the speed speed you're um, desiring for this material. Um, so let's say we wanted to do feed speed 200. We would do it that way. Um, there are different, how do I say that? Different cuts that you could, so you could set up a material code override for your face machining versus your border machining. So if you were wanting to do just your face machining, you would just do T tool number, and then if you were going to do the feed speed, you would then put the F feed speed. Um, if you're wanting to also do your border tool, change your border tool, you would insert a pipe and then put another tool number in there. If you're wanting to use the same tooling information, you would put the same exact tooling information. Or if you're wanting to use, say, a completely different tool, like I wanted to use tool 103, I would then put tool 103. Um, for my border tool. If you're wanting to just change your border tool, you would insert pipe and then add tool 101, 103, whatever the tool number is that you're going to use for that. Um, so you can do just face machining, you can do just border machining, or you can do a combination of the two. Um, but that's how you would input a material code override. Great. Yeah, thanks for that. Yeah, it definitely adds a, a, a layer of flexibility there uh, to be able to override what you may have set up as a default router bit in your tool file, uh, as we were talking about earlier with Karen too, whether it was be a 3 8 or a half inch, whatever it was, this here, you have the ability to specify per material whatever tool uh, that you want to use. So exactly. thanks for showing that. Yeah, and we're going to be creating a document and putting it on the website because we don't have one currently up for that. Great. Yeah, so more information about this will be added to our, our help site. And so that's support.microbellum.com. Uh, that's where that can be found. Well, I think that'll do it for the questions that we had related to um, Toolbox and the setup, setup on our side. 
Uh, we are a little bit over time, but there was a few things I wanted to get back to with Karen and Josh related to uh, some troubleshooting. And so for that, I'm gonna go back and uh, share my screen to cover that information as we start to wrap things up here. So uh, yeah, there were some questions that we have received about um, discoloration, tool discoloration, things uh, that they find abnormalities on uh, the bits themselves. And so what can you tell us, uh, Karen, about that and what we should look out for? Okay, so again, the main thing with tool discoloration is going to be blue and dark marks from burning. And um, that's always an indication that you don't have the correct chip load. You're probably feeding too slow. And um, so that needs to then be looked at um, why this is happening. What I've seen um, actually quite a few times is that somebody, you know, gets a three wing uh, compression bit because they think they're going to get a better tool life, but they're feeding, of course, with a three wing, you're going to have to be feeding 800 inches and upwards in order not to burn it up. So, um, you know, there's this fallacy of uh, more wings, better finish, and, and uh, that's just not, simply not true. It just gives you um, faster feed rate capabilities. So anytime there's um, discoloration, I say go back to the chip load calculator and uh, verify that what, you know, where you need to be. Mm -hmm. And of course, if you're cutting plywood, you know, now and, you know, the next panel on the table is MDF, you're going to have to adjust the feed rates. Mm -hmm. So um, always good to keep that in mind. And then um, the other slide showed the collet marks. I think there was a question on that as well. Yep. Um, what does that mean when you see the collet marks on that uh, shank here that we've got the arrow pointing to? Um, what that means is that there's chattering going on during the cut. When everything is in order, you should not see any marks from the collet on the tool shank. If you see marks like that, um, you know, probably old collet, you might not have the collet nut um, forked correctly. You might have a static um, collet nut, which um, really is, is not the ideal. Um, solution, the ball bearing collet nut is a better nut, even though I know there's this um, uh, sales pitch about a static um, uh, coated nut, but uh, in, in my opinion, after 30 something years in this industry, I, I think that's just a sales pitch um, because um, I, I've seen too many tools actually slip out of the, um, the collet on these uh, uh, static nuts. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, another thing that you sometimes will see uh, is when the tool breaks, uh, it usually breaks right below the shank, which you see on this lower image, um, but sometimes it actually breaks um, on the shank itself, within the shank area, and that's uh, most, most often uh, due to incorrect torque. So investment in a torque wrench and a you know set of fixture and a torque wrench is going to uh, uh, you know definitely um, save you money on full body. Okay, well that's great, uh, great information for everyone to consider uh, related to that. Um, I think that was the last of the questions. There was a few others that came in, but I think we covered them in other areas that we were working with mm -hmm. about. And as well, just to highlight once more that excellent document uh, that is available in PDF form or printed hard copy that you can get uh, from your website. That link is there. If you want to learn more about that, keep a copy on your desk out at your CNC machine. Um, that's a handy thing to have. So yeah, I think that'll do it for today. We had a little bit of a, a late start, uh, but we appreciate you guys taking the time to join us. As we wrap up things here, um, I want to tell you about what's happening next week. We actually have a, a really nice live episode lined up for you to, uh, to next week. We're inviting one of our customers on. Uh, is from is Ben ba Ben Brower from Stillwater Cabinetry. He's going to be talking to us about his process, how he uses microvellum within his shop for residential cabinetry. And we're going to talk to Isaac Dale too, one of our account managers. He's going to help lead that conversation, uh, the discussion there with uh, Ben. We're going to get to see some of the projects he's been working on and, and how he's adapted uh, his microvellum software to his, fit his needs there at his shop. 
this should be a really good event and uh, we definitely want to encourage you to attend that one if you are evaluating microvellum or you're just getting started or perhaps you're just curious about how others are using microvellum in their shop that's always a nice one to see as well so registration for that episode will be available by the end of today um, and so that'll about wrap it up for this week, uh, for this week's episode. On behalf of our team here at Microvelm, I'd like to thank each of you for joining us today. And we will catch you next week on our next Microvelm Live episode. <laughs>